Hello, in this school grad video, we're going to talk all about driving guidance. So most students might be going abroad for the first time and depending on different countries, there are different driving guidelines, rules and regulations which are very, very different from driving in India. So I'm going to focus mostly on the US and um, there are going to be similar guidelines abroad, you know, in different countries there will be slight modifications and differences, but I'm going to mainly talk about how driving in foreign countries is different from driving in India and what you should be careful about to do and not to do. First of all, let's take a look at different countries and see whether they drive to the right or to the left. You know, in India, we drive to the left, but it can be very confusing for people who go to the US because you keep it to the right. So, US, we keep to the right of the road. Great Britain, United Kingdom, left of the road. Australia, left. Germany, right. Canada, right of the road. So, you know, US and Canada both keep to the right of the road. Singapore, left. France, right of the road. New Zealand, left. Switzerland, right of the road. So, if you see most of the European countries, so there's Switzerland and France and Germany, they all keep to the right of the road, but UK keeps to the left of the road, so it's kind of confusing. You know, you can get an international driver's license from India, which is valid for up to one year, and you can use it to drive in different countries, but you have to be aware of the rules and regulations in each country, and ignorance of the law is not an excuse for getting in trouble or causing an accident. So using an Indian or international license in the United States. You can drive in the USA against your Indian driving license for a year as long as the license is valid and in English. So even if you don't have an international driving license, you can use your Indian license to drive in the US for up to a year. And it usually varies from state to state. Sometimes in some states it might be valid, they might let you drive with your Indian license only for up to six months. So you have to be very careful about these things. And you can also rent a car using your Indian license for a few months. So let's say a person is coming to the US on a business visa for just like two months. Uh, he might never apply for a US driving license and he might use his Indian license and you rent a car to see places and drive perfectly legally. So, but you also have, I mean, in some states, you have to you have an international driving license. So review the rules of the particular states that you're going to visit. And if your Indian license is not in English, then you have to carry an international driver's permit, which is in English. You also have to have a copy of the I-94 form, which shows the date to enter the US. So when you enter the US, at the port of entry, they give you an I-94 form, which stamps the date of entry and the date of departure. And the I-94 form, you have to carry a copy of that with you. Earlier they used to uh, staple it to the passport, but nowadays it's all electronic. So you have to go on the particular website, just Google it, I-94, and you go on the website and put in your details, and you can print out your I-94 form. So you have to carry a copy of your I-94 form. So if your cop pulls you over, you have to say, I entered the country on this date, so for up to a year I can use my Indian driver's license, and so I'm using my Indian driver's license. So that's the way it works. So Canada, using an Indian driver's license. So in Canada, you can use your Indian driver's license for up to three or six months after you arrive in Canada. It depends on each state, I guess. So it's wise to get an international driver's license before you leave your home country. So your international driver's license, you can perfectly legally drive for up to a year in different countries. So regardless, you will eventually need to take a driving test to obtain a Canadian driver's license. UK, using an Indian license. In the Great Britain, you remember you drive on the left, same as in India. So England, Scotland and Wales, regardless of which part you visit, allows foreign visitors to drive on their home country's license for a year. However, you're only permitted to drive the class of vehicle like small motor vehicle or motorcycle which your license permits. That applies to almost every country. Germany, drive on the right. 
So in Germany, you can use your Indian license for up to six months. And with an international driving permit, I mean, you don't really need it, but it's best to keep it handy as it contains translations and it might help the local authorities inspect your papers better. If you want to, don't want to get an international driver's permit, you can obtain a translation of your Indian driver's license from any German diplomatic mission. So in Germany, they might want it. If it's in English, you're probably okay. But sometimes it's better to review whether they want it in German. Australia. So drive on the left. So New South Wales, Queensland, South Australia and the Australian Capital Territory all let you drive against a valid Indian license. The Northern Territory does so too, but with a caveat. You can drive for three months only. So it varies from state to state in Australia. Do note that across Australia, you may only drive the vehicle that your Indian license allows you to drive. That applies to all countries. Singapore. So, if you intend to remain in Singapore for less than 12 months, you are not required to convert your foreign driving license to a Singapore driving license. You may drive in Singapore with a valid foreign driving license. However, if your license is not in English, in addition to a valid foreign driving license, you are requested to, required to have an international driving permit. And um, if you don't get an international permit, you have to translate it into the English language, if it's not in English. But usually most Indian licenses are in English. So, If you're holding an employment pass or a dependent pass or a student pass or work permit, and you're likely to reside in Singapore for more than 12 months, and you wish to continue to drive in Singapore, then you're required to convert your foreign driving license to a Singapore driving license before the end of your 12 months stay. So... How to get a U.S. driver's license? There's the DMV, Department of Motor Vehicles. So in India, there is something called the RTO, Regional Transport Office. The U.S. equivalent is the DMV, Department of Motor Vehicles. And it's the governmental organization in the U.S. that it issues driver's license and where you register your vehicles and where you pay vehicle taxes. It is equivalent to India's RTO. So, so you have to usually first take a written exam which demonstrates your proficiency of the rules and regulations in that country. So it varies from state to state. And uh, sometimes, so let's say you have a driver's license in Arizona and suppose you move over to California. Within 10 days, you're required to inform the DMV of a change of address and register the new address and also get like a California state driving license if you plan to live there. So. You also have to give an actual driving test with a DMV certified instructor. So, some DMV certified instructor has to validate that you you know uh, the rules about driving and uh, shifting lanes and about um, backing up and also about uh, parking, like parallel parking and serial parking. They usually test those as well. So, in addition to driving, they test your ability to serial park and parallel park on the curbs. There are a lot of rules when it comes to parking. So it's much more complicated than driving in India. In India, you usually drive using your common sense. You just have to navigate your way in the traffic. If everybody is going in a certain way, you just flow with the traffic. But in America, there are way too many rules. And the cops are always waiting to give you tickets. It's much more complicated. There's a lot of lane discipline and a lot of more you know, regulated traffic, but too many rules and you know too many cops sometimes all the time waiting to catch you on the wrong foot. So DMV written test. It consists of many multiple choice questions. Review the driver's handbooks and take practice tests online. So at the DMV you get a free handbook which contains all the rules and regulations. If you study that thoroughly you can clear the test the first time. I think you have to get like 80% to clear most of the written tests. And if you study the handbook, that's more than enough. And um, you can also take a lot of practice tests online. You know, there are some free practice tests and also for a nominal amount, you can pay and get a, 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 take a practice test. Some links to the driver's manuals and practice tests of various states, um, they're given here. So most driving rules are also similar across the states, but there are some subtle differences. So if you go to this website here, dmv.ca.gov, and you see this PDF, There's, it talks about the driving rules in California. You can even get an electronic copy. You don't have to go there and get a physical 
um, uh, manual of driving instructions. So there's a, a different set of rules for New York. And there's also practice tests online. Just Google it. Let's say a driver's manual practice tests for New York or for Massachusetts. And you get take the practice tests online. A lot of them are also free of cost. So do your homework, go over the rules. So even if you come with an Indian driver's license or an international driver's license, you must mandatorily review the driver's manual and also take some practice tests online just so you're familiar with the rules. When I came here, I was quite young, about 21, 22 years old. And uh, at the age of 23, I was driving all over the East Coast and I hadn't even bothered to review the driver's manual or learn the rules of the country and I made a lot of mistakes. Luckily, I never got a ticket in my life, but there were some rules that I wasn't even aware of. You know, the kids who grow up in the US, they see their parents drive, they observe people drive, and it's so obvious to them. But it wasn't obvious to me or to a lot of my Indian friends who came to the US for the first time. And I'm going to talk about a lot of mistakes that we made. Some of them are really funny, and some of them might be serious, but you can probably learn from them. So rental cars. So these are some of the popular rental car companies in the US. There's Enterprise, Budget, Hertz, Avis, Dollar Rental. These are some of the popular rental car companies. You can create a rewards account with one or all of these car rental agencies. So every time you rent a car, you get reward points, which you can end cash later. It's just like using free miles in your flight tickets. So these are the websites for these rental cars. Enterprise.com, Hertz.com, Budget.com, Avis.com, Dollar.com. So different companies have different prices in different cities. So it's like if you just use Expedia or something to book a ticket, suppose you're flying to Boston for a conference and you need a rental car for three days. If you use like Expedia.com, it searches for rental cars across all these different companies and it will tell you, uh, give you a comparison of which rates are lowest at that point of time in that particular place. And using a website like Expedia is that, you know, it covers all the other popular websites like Orbitz, Priceline, Travelocity for even flight tickets. So it gives you like the best of the best. So it's good to have rewards accounts because you can accumulate points and then uh, and cash them later. Buying a used car. So a lot of students, if you're coming abroad for the first time, think about buying a used car because in America, you know, you need like the three C's to survive. You need a cell phone, a computer, and a car, without which there's like no life. It's very difficult. So a cell phone, of course, everybody almost like needs one. There's hardly anyone without a cell phone. So, And you need a laptop because so many things are done online. It's almost like mandatory for survival. And without a car, it's very difficult to travel around the United States and also so many other countries. Like in the US, if you're in New York, of course, you, it'll be very difficult to have a car because you can't find parking spots. But in some parts of California, there's some kind of public transport. But in a lot of places, the public transport is very poor. And you have to know to drive or carpool with somebody else or, you know, share a ride. Because if you can drive to your work spot in like 10 minutes, if you take public transport, there's very limited number of buses or trains and it might take you an hour to get there. So in a lot of places it happens. Public transport is not very good in the U.S. You have to rely on your own mode of transportation. So um, where to buy a used car in the U.S.? Check out www.craigslist.org. A lot of people sell their cars like, you know, some of these cars are really good. Uh, the other place is suleka.com. That's more like an Indian portal. So there's also carmax.com. Carmax is a place where they certify, sell you certified cars. Like, you know, they're usually more expensive than, you know, buying on Craigslist or Suleka. So... If you just do a quick search, you'll find a lot of um, cars that are being, uh, that may be really good, but they have a lot of miles on them. Like if they have more than 100,000 miles or something, they sell these cars for, 
very cheap, like $2,000, $3,000. Some of these are in really good condition too. So, don't buy cars that have been in accidents. If they've been salvaged and reassembled or, you know, repaired, then they have a very low resale value. Verify the car's details using Kelly Blue Book and the VIN number. That's the vehicle identification number. So that's like a huge kind of 16-digit number or something like that, which every vehicle has. And ask for the VIN number before buying a car and put it up, uh, do a Google search and look it up on Kelly Blue Book. See if the car has been a major accident. See if it has been like salvaged and repaired. You don't want to buy that kind of a car because you, you probably won't be able to sell it later for a good price. And test drive the car with a friend. So always test drive before you buy. And if possible, take it to a garage and have it assessed if it needs any repairs. You know, when I was a student, both in my MS and MBA programs, I didn't have a car. So I couldn't see much of America. So when I started working in California, after I graduated with my MBA, I first bought a used car for like about $4,000. So, but then I had to, t you know, these used cars, you can't usually take them for long drives for more than two hours or three hours. They probably can't withstand it. So I was working in the Bay Area in Santa Clara and then I had to move to LA. So it was like a six hour drive and I wanted to see if this used car could withstand the drive. So I took it to the garage for assessment and they, um, they said the transmission belt was all worn out and the brake pads were all gone and the air filter was gone and you know so many problems. I had to spend thousand dollars to get them all repaired. So if you're buying a used car, don't expect it to be in perfect condition. It is what it is. They sell it as is. But try and get it assessed before you buy. Because after you spend like 4000 or $5,000 to buy a used car, you don't want to end up spending another $1,000 for repairs. So among all the used cars, do your research. Spend like a few weeks to meet a lot of people who are selling used cars. And buy one that's in a good condition. Where the transmission belt is not worn out. Mainly the brakes and the transmission belt. The air filters, you have to worry about these things apart from the engine. So... It happened to me once, um, when I was in Atlanta, I was very young and then I didn't know any better. I went to a Pakistani dealer who sold me a used car. It was like a salvage car, I mean, that had been in an accident and it had been totaled and then he had repaired it. His business was to sell cars, sold it to me for $5,000, which was much more than what it was worth. I was very young and inexperienced, but I bought it. And uh, I didn't get it checked before buying, so the brake pads were all worn out. And I took all my friends and we went to the Mall of Georgia and we were driving back and I'm trying to apply the brakes and, you know, the car's not braking. So then I somehow went and pumped the brakes and stopped on the side and then I realized the brakes were fully gone. I was just lucky I didn't get in an accident. So then I had to spend $500 to get the brakes, the brake pads, or the brake lining was fully gone. We had to get the brakes repaired. So when you buy a used car, it's very tricky. You can also go to a lot of these um, like Toyota showrooms or this kind of places where they sell cars. They buy a lot of used cars and they sell it to you cheap. But always get it, you know, checked by a garage or the showroom or whoever, by a mechanic, before you buy a used car. Because you buy a car for $2,000, I've seen this happen to people. And by the time they're driving it home, it's like gone. The engine's fully gone and engine is seized and, you know, brakes are gone and... The entire $2,000 is gone down the train. I've seen this happen to a lot of people. Always get the car inspected before you buy a used car. And it's better to invest at least like $6,000 and buy a car from CarMax because it's certified, it's under warranty. I mean, CarMax may not be the best place to buy cars, but depending on your budget, I mean, think about it. If you have $4,000 to invest on a used car, you might as well keep the money and buy like a really good car for which is worth let's say about $10,000, okay? Like a Honda Civic or a Toyota Corolla. Buy it for $10,000 and you get financing. And every month you pay about $200. So you, you can make enough money to, you know, repay it over a period of time. So if you have four or $5,000 that you're ready to invest in a used car, you might as well use that for your monthly payments to buy a car that's worth 
ten or fifteen thousand dollars. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Because you get financing if you have a good credit score and credit history. So think about that. Verify the car history using the VIN number. So on Kelly Blue Book, enter the VIN number, and it's this number uniquely identifying each specific vehicle. It serves as the car's fingerprint. No two vehicles in operation can have the same VIN. So it's a 17 character digits and capital letters number that's a unique identifier for each vehicle. VIN displays the car's unique features, specifications, and manufacturer. VIN can also be used to track recalls, registrations, warranty claims, thefts, and insurance coverage. So this is like something mandatory you have to do before you buy a used car. Look at the VIN number online. So you can get car financing and the rate of interest is usually very low. If you're buying a hybrid car, I mean, sometimes um, it depends, okay? The rate of interest could be anywhere between 0 to 4%. So there was one time I bought a new Toyota Corolla for about um, $17,000 and I had like 0% interest. So every month I would pay about $289 for about five years. So that worked out very well. So. A lot of college students, even when you're a student, if you can afford to pay about $150 or $200 a month for car payments, you can buy a car that's worth about $10,000, a really good car. So th think about that. You know, some students, they buy really cheap cars, like $1,500 worth of car, and then, you know, uh, they just use it within the campus town, and, you know, after they graduate, sometimes they might just sell it cheap or just discard it. So that's another thing you could do. So, leasing a car. You can also lease a car instead of buying a car. And a lot of people do this if um, they don't plan on staying in a place for a long time or if they're not planning to be in the US for a long time. They just lease a car for like six months and then return it. So that's like hassle free. So it's much cheaper than purchasing a new car because then again you have to pay for registration again find someone to sell it to, it's a hassle. So think about leasing a car, it works out cheap. And it's a good option for short-term projects. So gas station. So in India we call it a petrol bunk. So in America, petrol or diesel is called gas. So a gas station is where you get gas for your car. Do's and don'ts. So petrol and diesel and other vehicle fuel are generally referred to as gas, collectively. And in India, in the petrol bunks, you usually have workers. You pay them and they give you the right amount of petrol, or sometimes they cheat you, whatever. But in America, and in most of the countries, you have to get down from your car and fuel your car by yourself. So if you're in America, learn to do things on your own. You have to do your own dishes, do your own laundry, vacuum your house, you have to mow your lawn. I mean, unless you have money to pay someone to do it. And you have to learn to get gas for your own car. You have to learn to do everything by yourself. So, uh, there are usually three types of fuel ratings at the gas station. Like, it's the octane count on the fuel. It's 80, 87, 89, or 91. So, these are different uh, levels of, uh, different types of fuel. It depends on their octane content and also the level of refinement, I guess. They, just different types of fuel different, suited for different types of cars. And it's not necessarily a reflection of the purity or quality of the gas. It's about the amount of octane in the gas. The different numbers represent different levels of octane. 87 is the lowest octane level and it goes up from there. So, um, I, I used to think that if you, you know, the uh, 87 type of fuel is it costs less than 89, costs less than 91. So I used to think that if you buy more expensive fuel, you get better mileage. But that's not true. I learned it the hard way. And like from my car, I have a Toyota Prius, a hybrid car. You know, a hybrid car is one that works, runs partly on electricity and partly on gas. You know, you don't have to charge it at the, ga at the electric station, but it's kind of highly fuel efficient kind of car with a very powerful engine compared to a, a regular car. So I, I like hybrid cars and they're fuel efficient and it, they save you a lot of fuel cost and energy. So uh, for my Toyota Prius, I used to always buy 91 grade of fuel. 
I used to think you pay more money and you get a better mileage, but that's not true. So you have to look up what kind of fuel is suited for your car. So for my car, it was like the 87 that was what it's designed to operate on. And if you use a different octane rating, it can actually make it less efficient. So you have to know which grade of fuel to buy for which car. A lot of people don't know this. So um, in the gas station, remember, if you pay cash at the counter, like you park your car at the uh, pump and then you go inside and pay cash, or there's like usually a machine with slots, you pay cash, it usually costs like sometimes up to 10 cents lower per gallon. So remember, it's cheaper to pay by cash than using a credit card. Gas station safety guidelines. So a lot of car thefts and attacks happen in the gas stations, especially when it's dark. So if it's dark, unless you absolutely have to, I would highly recommend you to avoid going to gas stations in the dark. There are a lot of bad people in the world and, uh, you know, a lot of people have been attacked in gas stations and robbed. So it's very risky. So suppose, uh, let's say, you get off your car and you're busy fueling your car, you're putting in all the credit card information at the bunk and then there have been instances when some criminals, thieves, they enter your car from the back door and hide in the back seat and you don't even know it. And after you fuel your car, you just get in the seat and you drive off and there's like a thief at the back. So this happened to a woman. She uh, was uh, fueling a car and luckily for her, the gas station owner had noticed this, you know, criminal getting in her backseat and he kept on calling her over the intercom repeatedly. You haven't paid for the gas, you haven't paid for the gas, come in. And she's like, hey, I paid, I got the receipt. What is he talking about? And then she went inside and he said, hey, there's a criminal in your car. And they called 911 call the cops so uh, so one lady had a criminal enter her car in the gas station or, you know uh, it happens at the ATMs too try and avoid going to the ATMs in the dark so the other bit of guidelines I would like to give you is about you know there's one more thing I'd like to talk about uh, about gas stations like if somebody offers you their visiting card in a gas station like Suppose he looks like a poor daily wage laborer, like a painter or a carpenter or some kind of, you know, daily wage laborer. A lot of Mexicans especially, like, I mean, suppose somebody comes and gives you their visiting card. Don't take it. There was once a huge scam where people would offer this visiting card which had a kind of chemical on it. So the moment you touched it, you would feel dizzy and stuff. So this woman took this card from this uh, Mexican guy and... Then she started driving and she was feeling terribly dizzy and she noticed this Mexican guy and his friends were following her. She realized she had been kind of drugged. So she went and took a turn into somebody's driveway and stopped and honked continuously. And that alerted the people in the neighborhood. Somebody came out and then these people uh, left her and ran away. And then she became unconscious and then somebody called 911. And then they realized this was an organized crime. So if somebody offers you a visiting card, be very careful. There was also like, you know, cases where there was this guy who was a serial rapist and a serial murderer. He used to pretend to be handicapped. You know, he was a senior looking guy, in, probably in his 60s. And he would pretend to be limping and handicapped in the dark, trying to get into his car. And he would prey on women who were alone. And if the woman tried, he would ask for help. And if she tried to help him get in the car, he wasn't really handicapped. So he would, you know, get her into the car, maybe with the help of an aide, and then, you know, rape and murder the woman, things like that. You have to be so careful when you're on your own. And this next bit of advice I'd like to give you is about honking. So in India, people like to honk, 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 and pom, pom, pom. They like to honk all the time. But in America and other Western countries, people honk just once or twice, usually when they're mad, when you're angry with someone. In America especially, honking is considered a great insult. And you don't realize how serious the offense is. So, 
one of my European friends visited India and they were like, why are people mad at each other all the time? So they are in a traffic signal and the moment the light turns green, they have to honk. It's like asking for right of way or alerting the other person to move. But in America or in Europe, other countries, you honk only when you're really angry and mad at someone. When somebody is, you know, committed a mistake, like they came into your lane without an indicator or they're driving, not following lane discipline. They're doing something wrong, you're mad at them, you honk at them. And it's considered a great insult. Especially if a guy is driving with his girlfriend or his wife or something and you honk, he feels terribly insulted because the girlfriend would think he doesn't know driving or something. So, please don't honk unnecessarily, especially in America and also in other Western countries. So, uh, a few years ago there was this uh, driver in Texas who shot an Indian guy because he kept honking long and unnecessary. So he got annoyed and he actually took out his gun and shot him dead. Texas, as you know, is infamous for rash drivers and harsh language, so... Uh, there was also another incident, like, I mean, it's dangerous to honk at someone and annoy them. One of my um, uncles had a friend, his name was Steve, and he was going home from playing racquetball or something and somebody, the car behind him, honked at him really in an annoying way. And this guy got so mad, he decided to follow that car and shoot that guy down. He had a gun with him and so, you know, a lot of people have guns. So he followed this car and the car went, uh, for, for many miles he followed this car and somehow he lost track of this car. and. He followed another car which was similar, thinking that that was the car, you know, that those were the people that had honked at him. And then he followed that car and those people reached home and he went and knocked on their door with a gun in his hand and he opened the door. It was a family in his neighborhood and they recognized him and they're like, Hey Steve, hey what up man? And they're like, hey did you guys honk at me? And he's like, this guy's there with a gun in his hand and they're like, hey no Steve, we didn't honk at anyone. We didn't honk, wait, what's up, are you okay? Would you like to have some beer? And the guy's like, no, somebody honked at me. And he's like, hey, it wasn't us. And the guy walks away. He wanted to kill that guy, shoot him down. I mean, there's all kinds of crazy people in the world. You honk at someone, you make them really, really feel insulted and angry. So please avoid honking when you're in the US and other countries. It's not like in India. It's considered a great insult. Please keep that in mind. So follow lane discipline. This is something that Indian drivers also need to learn when they are in the US and other countries. So in America and other countries, lane discipline is very important. You have to drive in a straight line, not like, you know, zigzag and, you know, squeezing in wherever there is space like you do in India. So if you are driving in a haphazard way, somebody might just call 911 and say, there's electric driving, this person may be drunk and the cops can come and you know, they take this very seriously, they give you a test, you know, they make, you, make sure you're sober, give you the breathalyzer test and, you know, give you a warning, make sure you drive right, you know, it's, it's very serious, you have to follow lane discipline. That's something I found very hard to do when I started driving. I was very young, maybe 22, 23 years old and I found it hard to do based on my Indian driving habits and I had to learn to follow lane discipline. So. It doesn't happen overnight. And if you're in a lane and you want to switch to the left or right, regardless, left or right, you have to put on your indicator and give at least four second notice to the people behind you. Put your indicator on for at least four seconds and only then, you know, find the right, most appropriate moment to switch lanes and only then you switch lanes. Carpool lane. So when I first came to the U.S., I didn't know what this symbol meant. I would see the symbol on the streets all the time and I never really bothered to find out what it means. It's for carpooling. So a carpool is when there's two or more people in a vehicle. It's kind of a government's initiative to encourage people to share rides or to carpool and, you know, go together so they can reduce pollution and reduce the traffic. So. 
if you see this diamond shaped symbol in a particular lane that means that that lane is reserved only for vehicles that are carpooling so it can be even members of your own family whoever they, you just have to have two or more people in the car so the leftmost lane is usually carpool lane and it usually goes much faster than the other lanes because it's for people that have two or more drivers so and if you have this double line whether it's white or yellow you're not supposed to cross a double line into or out of the carpool lane only when there's a cracked white line that's when you cross so remember that and if you are alone and you're taking the carpool lane you can get a fine of like three hundred three fifty dollars or more than that and some people try to act too smart they try to get like a big uh, doll or something and they have a scarf around the doll's head and they tie the scarf to the tie this doll to the passenger seat make it look like there's a person sitting there and if they are caught they probably find them more because not only are you breaking the law by taking the carpool lane when you're alone you're also trying to trick people into believing that there's a person there so it would make the cops more annoyed it's not worth trying such tricks it's better to follow the law so carpool lane may be on the leftmost or sometimes the rightmost lane too, it depends. And uh, reserved for vehicles which are carpooling. And remember not to take the carpool lane even during in an exit. If you're taking an exit, you still if you're alone, you still can't take the carpool lane. So keep that in mind. So remember that on freeways there's not only an upper speed limit, there's also a lower speed limit. So a highway is called a freeway in the United States. And the speed limit is usually like 65 or 70 miles per hour on most of the freeways. But if you are towing a boat or towing a trailer truck, towing something with your vehicle, then your upper limit, maximum speed limit is 55 miles per hour usually. So it's also important to maintain a minimum speed of approximately 40 miles per hour on the freeway. If you're going less than 40, you're kind of disrupting the traffic on the freeway, so you can still get a ticket. You have to know all these rules before you drive in the United States and other countries. And once you get a speeding ticket, it increases your uh, auto insurance premium, your monthly premium drastically. So you have to be very careful about not to get speeding tickets. And if you get three speeding tickets, they can revoke your license for a while. Use radio for traffic updates. So there's these uh, ie511.org slash traffic and ozartraffic.com. There are so many websites. Just Google them and get traffic updates about popular routes that are likely to be jammed. And you want to avoid routes that have had an accident or have been jammed. So, I mean, if... Um, if there's an accident on a freeway, what usually happens is it takes a few minutes for the cops to come and, you know, uh, get the, you know, cars that have been in an accident onto the curbs and to clear the freeway. And what's going to happen is while all this is going on, people are going to slow down and keep looking on the side to see what's happened, what happened. It's called rubbernecking. And the traffic slows down to like 5 or 10 miles per hour. So, and it usually gets stuck for like half an hour, one hour, two hours sometimes and there's miles and miles of traffic so get traffic updates and avoid routes that have had accidents or traffic jams. How to interpret addresses in the US? So in India people are used to writing addresses saying it's in this particular main road and then you take the street road and then this crossroad and then there's a temple there, it's behind the temple or behind the school. They give you all these landmarks and guidelines which help you find a house or a place easily but it's not like that in the US. So usually they usually say like say 110 William Street, Manhattan, New York. So, you know, they don't tell you which main road it comes off of and um, in which part it is, you know, you just have to use a GPS or you have to use a map to find your way there. So, um, for example, I had to once go to 110 William Street in uh, Manhattan, New York, for an interview and uh, even the cab driver didn't know. Uh, there were three or four cab drivers and they didn't know where William Street was. And then one of them, one of them said, oh, it's off of Fulton Street, it's by Path Station. So, 
then I have to learn, you know, go to Path Station and then take Fulton Street and then somewhere you take a, a, a turn onto William Street. So it's important to have a map or at least have a, a cell phone where you can pull up a map and look it up online or at least use a GPS. It's not very expensive to buy a GPS. You can get one for $50 to $100. So if you're um, mailing something to somebody or writing an address anywhere on the envelope or in a form or anywhere, write it exactly the way it is. Don't try to give more information to easily identify the place or anything. Just write the address exactly as it appears on the website or a map. Okay? Learn to interpret these addresses. Like, for example, uh, I was once, uh, you know, working in Nashua, New Hampshire. You know, it's very close to Boston. And I had relatives in Boston, so I told my mother uh, I lived close to Boston. You know, so she knew I was somewhere near Boston because she didn't know where New Hampshire and Nashua were. And then she was mailing me a big package for my birthday. And I gave her the exact address and she wrote Nashua, New Hampshire, put the zip code and everything. And then the Indian said, Oh, she kept saying Boston all this while, so she wrote Boston in the end. She's trying to be over smart. But then the package came all the way to the US. They might have tried delivering it. I mean, they didn't even try, so then they saw it's confusing and it went back to India. So write addresses exactly as they appear on the websites or the map. Don't give any kind of additional information. That's a tip I would like to give you. So how to interpret addresses in the US? Streets and avenues are always perpendicular to each other. A lot of people don't know this. And BLVD, that stands for a boulevard. A boulevard is nothing but a tree which is a street which is usually tree lined, which has trees on the sides. And DR stands for drive. ST stands for street. Highways are called freeways in the US. Get a GPS built in or portable. GPS, Global Positioning System, is a network of satellites that offer real-time directions and guidance to drivers. It is very difficult to drive in the US without a GPS. It gives you guidance in unfamiliar territory. And you, you know, in India, you can just stop by the roadside and ask somebody for guidance. But in the US, people are zooming by at such high speed. There's hardly any people to give you any kind of guidance, except you have to go to the nearest gas station or a store and ask the person for guidance. And even he may not be able to help you. So it's very important to have a GPS. And if you're buying a car, consider buying a car that has a built-in GPS. Or you can also buy a car and then get a portable GPS. So on some freeways, you won't even have a vehicle in sight for many miles if you're trans, you know, traveling in remote towns and cities. Portable GPS is very useful, costs less than $100 and you can just uh, plug it in your car. You have to buy a charger to plug it in and then, remember if you're using your cell phone for navigation GPS, it's going to drain the battery very quickly. So you have to buy a charger to connect it to the car, but it still makes your cell phone really hot. So for long distances, it's better to use a GPS, like a specific GPS device. Using cell phones while driving. In many states, it's illegal to talk on the cell phone while driving, and you can get a heavy fine. But it's okay to talk using hands-free or Bluetooth. So it's like a speakerphone, and, um, or you can have earphones, and as long as you don't hold it in your hand, hands-free, it's okay in most states but it's a big distraction to drivers believe me so I highly recommend not talking even hands-free on a cell phone while driving because it's so easy to get into an accident parking guidelines so when you're parking in the US or other countries remember to park within one foot of the curb you can't be farther away from the curb than one foot when the curb is painted red, you must not park on the street by that part of the curb. And if the curb is painted yellow, it's only for loading and unloading of passengers or vehicles and not for parking. Don't park within 15 feet on either side of a fire hydrant. So if there's a fire emergency, the fire truck will need to come and park by the fire hydrant and, you know, spray water. So you can't park 15 feet on either side of a fire hydrant. There are so many such rules which you can look it up on the, in the driver's manuals. An instructions book. 
When you park, make sure your car is not obstructing anyone's driveway or entrance even by a few inches or your car will get towed away. It happened to me once in New York. It was so difficult to find parking and I parked and my car was just protruding a little bit onto somebody's driveway. That person could have easily, you know, put his car inside and taken it out without any problems. But, but you know, I came out one evening and somebody was about to tow my car. I had to pay like $55 and tell him not to tow my car and take it away and park somewhere else. If it gets towed, it goes to a remote place and you have to find your way there and pay a fine and then get your car back. Handicap parking. This is interesting too. So if you see the symbol of like a wheelchair, this means it's only for handicapped people to park their cars. So if you see most of the malls, hospitals, offices, almost any institutions, they have a few spots close to the door which are for handicapped parking. And when I first got to the US, I didn't know that I didn't know how a cop would be able to identify whether I'm handicapped or not. And when I was driving in Atlanta, I mean, look, in America, it's like for the kids who grew up in the US, it's so obvious to them, okay? You have to have a placard. You have to get it from the DMV after following certain procedures. Suppose you fracture your leg and you need to have, be on crutches for like six months. Then they give you a handicapped parking permit placard for like six months. It has an expiry date too. And sometimes if you're permanently handicapped, they give you a permanent handicapped card, which you have to display in the car permanently. And only such people can park in the handicapped spots. So I didn't know that. It kind of seems stupid now, but a lot of my friends didn't know either. So I came to the US and every time I went to the malls or anywhere, I would always park in the handicapped spot closest to the door. I was like, how does he know whether I'm handicapped or not? And I would think, suppose I get pulled over, suppose a cop asks me why I popped here, I'm just going to limp and I'm going to say my leg is hurt. And he's going to think I'm handicapped. How is he going to know? I didn't know. It wasn't obvious to me. So you have to get a permit and display it in your car and only then you park in the handicapped spot. Otherwise, you get a fine and they also tow away your car. And it's also a kind of disrespect for the handicapped people. So... So you have to get a permit that looks like this and display it in your car prominently. It also has an expiry date usually, so think about that. How to navigate exits. So in the US there's free freeways that run for like hundreds of miles. And every approximately one mile or two miles there's like an exit that, that's a road that goes into the city or into the town. These are exits you will mostly have to take a ramp off the freeway to take the exit into the city or town. Always reduce speed when you take an exit because some exits are like a 360 degree curve, some are strongly curved, some are just straight roads, it depends. So if you try to navigate these dangerous curves at high speeds, you often lose control and have an accident. Happened to me once when I was uh, in New York driving to Connecticut to my uncle's place. I took an exit and I was driving at about say 50 miles an hour and you have to slow down to approximately 40 miles an hour or 35 miles an hour before you get onto the exit ramp. So I was going at around 50 and I, was, I took the exit and I didn't know it was like a 360 degree curve. I wasn't prepared for the steep curve. So I tried to take the exit at the hard speed and then I realized it was so uh, steep a curve. I suddenly braked and my car went spinning like that and luckily there was no concrete wall on the side of the exit there was only grass and like went on the grass and my car spun in the air like 360 degrees and landed on the grass and it went off and I'm like sitting there blinking on oh my car did that really happen and there's other cars that are taking the exit at high speed and then I turned the car back on it came back on and I went back on the exit luckily nothing happened to me but it could have been dangerous especially if it had been if there had been a wall on the side of the exit so when you take an exit always remember to lower your speed to up approximately 35, 40 miles per hour, and then take the exit, even if it's not a very steep curve. So remember, driving in India is very different from driving in other countries. So uh, if you see this picture, this is a freeway, and if you take this particular lane, you go to 101 North, 
And if you take this particular lane, you go 101 south towards San Jose. 101 north goes to San Francisco. So if you're not in the proper lane, you suppose you're in this particular lane, you go to 101 south. If you're intending to go north, you might end up going south. It's that serious. You have to be in the right lane. And if you're in the last lane, you will have to mandatorily take the... If you're here, you take the exit and you go to 82 El Camino Real. So if you're in this particular lane, for example, you can either take the exit or you can continue to go this way. But sometimes if you're in the rightmost lane, you have to mandatorily take the exit. So there's a symbol that says exit only. Sometimes you have to be very careful about which lane you're on. And otherwise you might miss your exit. And then you have to go further and then find a way around again, get back to the exit or something like that. So each lane can take you to a different destination. It's very different from driving in India. So you have to get enough practice. And another common mistake that people make when they start driving in the US is, you know, in India, they have a free left turn. So they're used to turning free left. In India, they turn free left. But in America, it's the free right turn. So when they're turning left, a lot of Indian drivers, they turn to the left side of the road. I mean, they start driving on the opposite side of the road. So left turn, you have to go all the way around toward the right of the road. But they forget. I used to make that mistake too. And they just go on the left side of the road. And they see cars coming in the opposite direction. That's a mistake that people commonly make. So what do you do when I miss an exit? Suppose you're driving in Georgia and you're going all the way to North Carolina. And you're supposed to take exit 87. And you miss the exit. What do you do? You just go and take the next exit and then take a U-turn and come back on the freeway in the other direction. And then take another exit and again take a U-turn and then get back on the freeway and then take the exit 87 that you wanted to take. These are things that were not obvious to me when I came here as a grad student and I started driving for the first time. I wish somebody had told me all these things. So, toll gates. Many freeways require drivers to pay toll. So if it's like a bridge or like a prominent freeway, you might have to pay toll. And if you didn't know about it and if you didn't have cash, then they send you a ticket home. So that's the way it works. Usually there's like a manual counter where a person is collecting toll. And uh, sometimes it might be a completely automated electronic toll system. So. Like if you go on the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, it's completely electronic. There's no person sitting there to collect cash. And when I went there, I didn't know that. And I didn't have, you know, the fast track or easy pass, fast track to pay toll automatically. So I went there and then it takes a picture of your car with the registration details and then it sends, it sent me a bill. The system sent me a bill for like $6, which I had to pay online. So... If you have fast track in your car, it's like an electronic system. And fast track is a card, it's like a sensor that you stick in the front of your car. And there's a sensor at the toll gate that catches the signal. And fast track, you already have to pay about a certain amount of money. There's a deposit there. And each time you deduct toll, $2, $5, you deduct the toll. So. It's good to have fast track or in the East Coast, they call it easy pass. So this again wasn't obvious to me when I came here. So I was in New York driving to Connecticut and I had to take this particular bridge. Um, I think it was the Whitestone Bridge or was it the George Washington Bridge? So I had to go to Connecticut and every time I took the bridge, I didn't know what easy pass meant. I would see some cars going there and paying toll and some cars just passing by in the easy pass lanes. You know, some lanes at the toll booth are reserved for people who have fast track or easy pass. So easy pass, they would just easy pass. So I thought easy pass is easy pass and I would just go in the easy pass. And my car didn't have a permanent registration number yet. So I never got a ticket, but then I didn't know what easy pass meant. You know what I mean? It wasn't obvious to me when I first came to the US. And so, so it's good to have fast track or easy pass and it's like, it's not a pay-as-you-go system. You deposit money into your fast track account and then it keeps deducting it every time. So fast track, the sensor looks like this and you stick it on the headboard. 
and it keeps deducting money every time you pay toll. So this is how it works. You stick it on the windshield or in the front and there's a tag reader. It senses, it gets a signal and uh, it calculates, I mean, what money, uh, what is the deposit you had, $25, whatever, deducts $5 and then lets you go. It automatically opens the gate to let you go. So that's the way fast track or easy pass works. So what do you do when your car gets towed for illegal parking or whatever reason? So you have to find out to which destination it was towed and uh, you can usually look it up on the DMV website or um, ask people and then you either take a cab or ask, get a ride and go to the place and pay a fine of $200 or whatever and get your car back. So that's what happens. What do you do when a cop pulls you over? So if you see the blue, red and um, white lights flashing behind you, it's the cop coming behind you, you have to just go to the rightmost lane and stop. So, and you can put on your parking lights if required. And don't get down from your car until the cop asks you to get down. Now this is an important bit of advice. So, if you try to get down from the car, they think you're trying to run away and they can actually shoot you in the foot or, you know, it happened uh, to a friend once. So she was in the gas station and suddenly the, she sees four police cars come and she got down saying, hey, what's going on? It's like, get back in the car right now. So you just got to sit in the driver's seat and just sit still. And don't move or bend down, okay? Don't try to pick up anything from your bag or something. You won't believe there have been so many instances when cops have actually shot drivers down just because they bent down to pick up something and the cop thought he was picking up a gun to shoot him. And so before the person could shoot him, the cop shot this guy and he said he did it in self-defense. So, so it's places like LA, New York, there have been so many such instances. When a cop asks you to stop, you just stop and sit still. And then you say, can I take my cell phone from the bag or can I pick this up or something? Okay, if you try to bend and pick something, they think you're picking a gun or something, they can just shoot you and they can get away with it because they say they did it in self-defense. So now we're going to talk about driving in rain. So if it's raining, drive very slow and your car might start hydroplaning. That is, there a thin sheet of water on the street and your car is no longer in touch with the surface of the road. And the car is just like, you know, moving on its own without your control. So what do you do? Don't uh, brake too suddenly and don't try to steer it because that won't work. Just brake slowly and drive very slow and try and go to the side and try and stop. Hydroplaning is very, very dangerous. And uh, give other vehicles more space. If it's raining, add one or two seconds extra space, worth of extra space between two cars. And if it's raining, avoid distractions such as cell phones, music, radio. And always remember to uh, put your um, fog lights, your headlights on when it's foggy and it's raining. Otherwise, you can get a ticket for that too. So... If your car starts hydroplaning and it can happen when you're driving as slow as 35 miles per hour in rain. You have to be very careful when you drive in, lane, in rain and the steering will get light in your hands. That's when you realize it's been hydroplaning and then you drive very slowly and brake slowly. Driving in snow. So if you're in snowy places like Michigan or Boston and if you've never seen snow before in your life, if you're not used to it, you better, you know, get some experience before you start driving in snow. So, uh, you have to know about, you know, braking smoothly, driving slowly. You know, they sort the roads so the ice melts, but then there's ice sometimes which you can't see and it can make your car skid and all kinds of accidents happen. Happened to one of my friends. She 
she and her husband and her two-year-old kid were in the car. The kid was in the back seat. And the car, uh, it was like an SUV, sports utility vehicle. And they were driving and suddenly the car skid in the ice and it crossed Boston and the car fell on the side and her hand went under the window, her right hand. And the car dragged her hand for so many meters and then the flesh on her right hand came off and she could see the bones and muscles of her palm and it was horrible and then she had to go to the surgeons and luckily um, the husband and kid were not injured and then they had to, they said they would stitch her hand to the groin so the skin would get drafted onto the palm and she said no please don't do that and then they took skin from her thighs and put it on her hand but now she can't so she can't chop vegetables she can't do many things but it looks like normal so i personally am not a big fan of living in snowy places for all these complications but if you're driving in snow you have to be extra careful and sometimes you have to get tires that are like all season tires which are specifically designed for driving in snow sunglasses can help to reduce the glare of low winter sun on the snow and um, Schedule a maintenance checkup for the vehicle's tires and tire pressure, battery, belts, hoses, radiator, oil, lights, brakes, exhaust system, heater, defroster, wipers, ignition system. Get them all checked out before the winter sets in. Keep your gas tank sufficiently full, or at least half a tank is recommended. Consider using winter tires or tire chains. So. Winter, even walking is dangerous, you know. There was one time in Michigan I was walking and even though there's soft snow, there's ice underneath. And I was wearing tennis shoes and I skid and I went and fell in the middle of the road. It was a very narrow road. And there was a car coming and it stopped like one foot from my legs. Otherwise, it could have run over my legs. You have to be so careful when you're on icy, snowy territory. So using radar and lidar detectors. So, you know, cops hide at the side of the freeways and they keep shooting these radar radar signals to determine your speed of your car. And in some states, you know, it's okay to use like a radar detector on your car. So you'll know that, oh, somebody is shooting a radar and then immediately it beeps and then you can slow down and you can avoid getting a ticket. But in some states like Virginia, for example, it's illegal to use a radar detector. So look up the rules and regulations for each state. It might be okay to use the detector in one state, but it's not okay to use it in some other states. Uh, so many people don't know that radar detectors are illegal. And uh, sometimes cops can know that you're using a radar detector and you can get in trouble. So, uh, So, I mean, there are only certain situations in which you can use a radar, radar detector, so. Uh, so, if you're entering a military installation, military facility, then you can't use a radar, radar detector. You have to mandatorily take it off, even if it's legal to use it in the state. And radar jammers are illegal under federal law, but laser jammers are not specifically banned. So, nine states have state laws specifically banning laser jammers. So... It prevents the cops from assessing your speed. That's what it kind of does. So there's California, Utah, Texas, Colorado, Minnesota, Illinois, Tennessee, South Carolina, Virginia. Red Red directors are legal. I mean, in these states, they are banned. And in some other states, they, you know, they may be valid. So you have to look up the laws in each state, okay? In some of these states, they may be legal, but... You know, Virginia, it's definitely banned. So you have to be very careful about these things. What do you do when you get in an accident? If you can navigate the car to the side of the road, navigate it to the side of the road. And then... If the other person is being rude or attacks you or gets in nasty arguments or threatens you, call 911. Anyway, call 911. They'll come and help you. And if your car cannot be driven to the side of the curb, just wait there, get off, and you at least you go to the curb. And the highway patrol will help move your car out of the way to prevent traffic congestion. So, 
if you're injured or anyone else is injured, call 911. The paramedics will be there in no time and they help you, you know, if you're sick or injured. And regardless of whether the other person has auto insurance, driver's license or not, take a picture of his car and the vehicle license plate number. Report the accident details to your insurance company. You have no business, you know, negotiating with his insurance company. Your insurance company must negotiate with his insurance company. That's usually the way it works. And provide the other details of the accident within seven days or the stipulated time limit to your insurance company. So, rubbernecking. So, what is rubbernecking? When there is an accident that happens, people invariably slow down and say, like, you know, they stick their neck out of the window and see, hey, how did that happen? What happened? That's called rubbernecking. And that slows down the traffic for many, many miles often. So roadside assistance. So sometimes you get a flat tire. You know, try avoid avoid driving on the rightmost lane or certainly avoid parking on the curb to talk on the cell phone or something. Because there's all kinds of sharp objects on the curb. There's nails, there's splinters, all kinds of objects and they cause you a flat tire. So if you get a flat tire, so call like 511. Sometimes they give you free roadside assistance. They repair your car free of cost. Call your insurance company, they can also get you free uh, uh, repair for your, they freely, they cannot change your flat tire if you have a step knee. So, uh, AAA is kind of efficient and they have a wide coverage, they are there in no time. So. This brings us to the end of this video about driving guidelines uh, in foreign countries. I've talked mainly about the United States. but. When you're driving abroad, there are all these rules that you need to remember. It's very, very different from driving in India. And there's cops all over the place waiting to catch offenders. So, driving abroad can be very risky and tricky. And if you get an accident and if you don't have medical insurance, remember, each day in the emergency room, like in the United States, is about ten to $15,000. So, you must have health insurance in these countries and uh, be very careful and safe and stop at the stop signs and follow all the rules. Don't try to beat the system. And I wish you have a safe time in your foreign countries and uh, be very careful while driving.